Anybody there? Hey. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And where are you coming from? This is my first mountain time experience. Yeah, I am over in the mountains of Wyoming. Whoa. The mountain of Wyoming, because we just have the one and then the Rockies are like our neighbors. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, yes. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me today on the podcast. So it's kind of a weird thing that happens in LinkedIn where we kind of get to meet random, random people. And you're one of those folks, uh, because I follow so many playwrights who came across the timeline. And I have to say that every time you post something, which is pretty regularly, you're a playwriting machine. I think that's the confirmation that I'm getting uh, there that you just constantly are doing a lot of work. So I'm very excited to get to talk to you and learn a little bit more about how that comes to be. So if it's okay, if we begin here, can we, can we talk about how you found playwriting uh, where you grew up? Because you're from New Jersey, right? Yeah, I grew up in, I'm in New Jersey now, and um, I grew up right outside D.C., but um, I loved writing. I thought I was going to go be a doctor, <laughs> but I kept winning um, playwriting contests uh, where I would, like, adapt, like, books about yellow fever into, um, <laughs> you know, Ooh, this is stage play. Yeah. But the influence really came. My uncle is um, is the founder of nytheater.com, which was a big mm. reviewing website. So when I was growing up, we would get to go see plays in New York City for free because he was reviewing them. And then I'd say even more influential, my mom runs her own editing and graphic design business. Mm. So when I was young, and I am kind of a... Uh, I don't know. I'm a very ambitious person. So, you know, perfectionist is the word I'm looking mm. for. So I'd bring like, you know, drafts of plays or scenes in early high school or middle school. And, you know, my mom would edit it like pretty hardcore. And then her group of friends were all, you know, that I still talk to are all writers and publishers. So, so they talk to you like an adult. They, they, they really said, like an adult. yeah. And I also, my hero growing up, I loved Michael Crichton and mm. his story. Um, and uh, he uh, was actually in medical school and just started writing books to pay for medical school. And, you know, he's the author of like Jurassic Park. <laughs> like, um, and I just liked the idea that you treating it like craft, treating it like this is something I can improve and use like my, you know, good business like student skills to become like there's no reason i you can't just work to become successful on it and i really love any writers who kind of debunk that oh it's luck i like the mm. ones that are like it's craft it's listening and it's putting your ego aside to get better right so uh you eventually decided to go to school for this or or did you end up going to to school for medical studies or anything like that <laughs> i kind of gave it up to the universe i applied to a few schools but I applied to an extremely competitive, uh, I was actually, uh, it was like a BFA in dramatic writing at SUNY Purchase, which was fairly affordable in Purchase, New York. And they only took like 12 people. And I was like, if I get into this, it's a sign from the universe that I'm supposed to go be a playwright and do it. And I actually got in and got a call from the dean at the time who was Kathleen Tolan. And she uh, helped me actually, she really wanted me to come. And actually, I was lucky enough to get a job in the admissions office while I worked there, um, which because I knew that being a playwright, it's good to at the beginning, it's good to have work. And I actually still work in academia. <laughs> I've worked for Columbia University School of the Arts and remote and they call it variable hours, meaning I just do about 20 hours a week. But I help with the tenure prep and the faculty searches and for the deans. Um, and I really, really enjoy that kind of work. So. I just kind of stuck with it <laughs> since college. So it seems like you you found early on a way to to be efficient, but also provide for yourself, which I think kind of goes by the wayside when we get a lot of education in college about being a, a performer or somebody in the performing arts. I wonder if that was your experience or if you felt like like the college experience was one that prepared you for the practical application of the performing arts in the in the real world, quote unquote, or or if you felt that there were things that you had to stumble your way through as as soon as you left university. 
Yeah, I think I'm just kind of one of those workers, and I grew up with a very um, hustle, hustle-like family where everyone was so productive and just such good workers. And I was always very independent. Um, and there's certain things that I always liked, like I wanted money to study abroad, and I like living in certain buildings and getting my nails done. So I just always uh, kind, of, and I still do. And you know, sometimes I help coach people <laughs> into finding it themselves, but you know, what do you want your day to look like? And kind of, I really, at a young age, was very frustrated with, oh, I'm st- I met so many starving artists. And I was like, ah, oh, that is not my path. Like, at like 16, <laughs> I was like, no, I'm going to prove to everyone. You know, I grew up outside DC, Virginia. And I remember some parents who were like, military parents would be like, oh my God, you want to be a playwright? Do your parents know? And I would just say very <laughs> triumphantly, like, yes, they're very proud of me. And I'm going to, I kind of had, um, I don't have this same ego anymore. I don't feel like I have something to prove anymore. And I meditate and do a lot of yoga. But back in the day, like 16 years ago, I'm 32 now, I was very like, I will prove you wrong. And like, I will show you. I don't have the same like ego, but I did. And I was like, I will prove you wrong. I will be the exception, not the rule. I will grow up and show you that I was successful and that there's a way to balance living a comfortable life with writing and um i'm gonna prove you wrong just because i can and i had this like very <laughs> intense i'm no longer that intense i channel it into my <laughs> i really had a very like oh i will prove you wrong <laughs> yeah but that's fascinating to hear because i feel like that is the purest engine right to get you to do something <laughs> and many of us many of us can wallow many of us can feel like we're not really using it to any advantage other than to just feel sorry for ourselves but how is it that that maybe in, in so much life you were able to just sort of distill that into a productive thing? Is yoga and mindfulness and, and a lot of self-work necessary for that kind of actuation where, where you're like, you know what, I'm I'm better now. I still can be productive, but I don't need to be upset about it. Yeah, I mean, with those sorts of with like walking or meditating or your daily practices. So I think what's very important is incorporating practices that help you forget about yourself too. Like, um, I love to meditate and I do meditation and visualization, visualization exercises in my, uh, course, uh, my one-on-one coaching. Um, I do it mainly because really all we have control over is our day. And I'm very inspired by like Lewis Howes at mm-hmm. School of Greatness, a yeah. lot of Uh, Mel Robbins. And so I just remember the story of um, Lewis Howes talking about how he started the School of Greatness. And, you know, he's on his sister's couch and (laughs) he went on LinkedIn and just started friending people and learning. And I just felt like, and I still feel like there's why, why, you know, maybe the arts are so, maybe it's so hard to make it because we think it's so hard to make it. What if we treated it more as a business? What if we, uh, you know, what if we promoted ourselves like we were there, you know, I could, and I tell anecdotes later in your, in your podcast, but I have been to Hollywood and back. I have, I guess I'll start. I'm just going to tell you the story. Yeah. So yeah. my career trajectory. So, um, I worked at Columbia university school of the arts and, uh, I wrote, I, I had, um, I had a wonderful mentor. I have a wonderful mentor that I knew through work um, who is in the industry. And I used my officer's tuition credit from working at Columbia to take a few independent studies with this person um, for like, you know, much less affordable. (laughs) And I just, that was like 26 to 28. And I wrote a Maisel spec script, which he read, it was called Shabbat Blessings for the Baguette. And this was also around the time where I won my first residency. So I went on the HBMG uh, residency, which is actually, that might've been mountain time. That's in Creed, Colorado. Oh yeah. (laughs) Um, So I had a wonderful time, but I started to like, oh, I'm like doing it. So I was about 28 and I wrote the Maisel spec and my mentor was like, I don't have any comments. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to email paradigm talent. So where the person was represented. Um, so I went to Hollywood, I was 28 and I had the agent lunch in Beverly Hills 
where you're awkwardly bought a quesadilla. I like had a quesadilla and I recently wrote about this for a screenwriting uh, blog. So it's very fresh in my memory, but basically you're sitting there, the world is kind of being offered to you on a plate. Um, but not like, it's like <laughs> very weird. And I've met agents before when I was 27, I had my show, the legal secretary got a reading in LA, which was fun. And I met a few agents. Um, and then I just remember going to San Francisco after to like detox and have fun. And, you know, I'm still using work vacation days. I still work at a full-time job at uh -huh. Columbian, but it was in an environment where my bosses were so supportive, like, oh my goodness, she's going to Hollywood for a meeting because that's what the faculty do, you know? So I got back and then I was sent to the New York office, New York paradigm, where I had similar, like, I have no, I think it was easier in New York. I could tell they weren't 100% interested in me, but in LA, <laughs> it's like, I was like, oh my God, like, they gave you the um, smoke screen and they gave you, uh, yeah, yeah the presentation. I mean, New York one, I've been to that office three times and I always dress to the nines because Adrian Brody is represented by Paradigm New York and I'm convinced <laughs> that he's going to walk in and see me and that'll be the end. <laughs> the first, you know, he's not married yet. He's in his late forties. He's been waiting for me. Um, so I always dress up very much to go. It's also a beautiful part of New York, um, plain and sister. So nothing happened and then we had our first strike of 2019 which explains a uh, lot of what thing happened <laughs> that was kind of in the background which i didn't realize and then next thing i know i'm put on a watch list and then we have a pandemic oh, so it's the pandemic and i'm like did that just happen like but now i'm remote for work full time and i moved back to the shore and sublet my upper west side home um and i just was like, okay, there's two choices. And this is where we get to like a Lewis house thing. I could either stay stuck and mourn what could have been, or I could write 10 times harder knowing that the door opened once. Mm. So I chose that one and I got my work done. So I worked with the Bombay Theater Company. I worked with Inkwell. I became the bi-coastal Zoom member for Playground LA. Like <laughs> I worked with the University of Miami. I wrote their senior thesis show like online. I got published twice. <laughs> like I just like was like anything I could find online, I just applied to it. And I think these were my happiest times because I took it into my own hands. And then when the pandemic started winding, it's like 2021, I actually was in a position to go part-time or reduced hours for Columbia and stay remote. And I took on some medical writing and I started teaching with the Knowledge Project group classes in screenwriting and playwriting. And then a few months ago, I've actually started my own, due to the demand, I started my own one-on-one -on -one coaching business, mm. um, which has been going really well. It's very rewarding. And um, then my shows, like, I just saw a show at Playwrights Horizon. And this is the first summer, this is the first season where I don't get a break, which is mm. a wonderful thing as a playwright. My show, Dracula in Denver, is getting its fourth and fifth production. Cassie's at the oh, Secret wow. Theater right now. Um, and then it just didn't, it, it didn't end, which usually I have like, oh, I have a couple months, but like Playwrights Horizon wrapped up. I actually won second place for best short. For oh, overnight. congrats. Yeah. Like I wasn't expecting that. That's a huge honor. Um, and then, yeah, I've never had like a, I don't have a break, like actually, <laughs> because I have starting the 19th, which is this week. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> four shows and then Dracula and Denver and on September 10th, Dracula and Denver goes to, um, a theater, but it, a theater in New Jersey, the, um, but what I try to teach clients and coach is that there's your passion project. Yes. But there's also, if you look at what's actually being in demand, like what people are looking for on the postings and you use it as a guide to what to write um there's a lot of opportunities so you'll see that 10 minute plays are really in demand 10 minute plays with x number of actors are really in demand 10 minute plays about this theme are really and that just increases your chances of getting produced that might not be your goal your goal might be to write the next great pilot the next great um spec script for your favorite show but if your goal is like i want to see my work done there is no reason why you can't you know and everyone always says oh i'm not a good writer it's like well, let's see how much you improve from one week to the next. And let's mm -hmm. look at that. Let's not look at this, like the big picture. Let's look at a week. Let's look at a day. Like, how do you spend your afternoon? Mm -hmm. I don't have time to write. Okay. 
When are you most productive during the day? Okay. You're a morning person. Okay. Um, do you enjoy exercising? Great. So when you're walking, could you think? Could you talk at sea now? Like, there's just um, really kind of debunking this, like, precious. It has to be perfect. Mm. Or I can send it. I was on um, Corey's uh, Instagram page. Um, who's a she's a um, actress and an acting coach. Also had Hollywood uh, dealings, and we were both talking about how um, it just comes down to what do you want your day to look like? Mm. How can we fit this into your day? What is that goal? Um, because really anything can be possible. It just may not look like how you thought it would look. Right. Right. And I love that it seems like the way that you coach or you go about sharing some insights uh, for the people that you're coaching, there's a lot of flexibility in in how the individual is choosing to define their goals and, and their purpose and things like that. But for a moment, I'd like to ask you about what your particular day looks like. And and if maybe we could get into some some playwriting examples, I, I'd love to talk about that, too. But just yeah. in terms of. What does is, what is a, a writing day look like to you? Something that's successful that allows you to get, to feel like you're you're actually getting things done. Yeah, so I do like to wake up. I am an early morning person. Um, and I do wake up and I do meditate using the Calm app, which I love for about 10 minutes. And then maybe I'll do like 10 minutes yoga. And then I like to go for a big walk. I'm on the shore for the summer. So I walk the boardwalk for three miles and come back. And then... Um, it just comes down to using if I dive into Columbia first thing, or if I give myself, I just do like eh, 30 minutes in the beginning mm -hmm. of the day. And uh, right now I'm working on a full length play, which I had a meeting about with a friend and fellow producer and director and playwright from Clearance Horizon. Again, I'm not going to, if someone actually, <laughs> you can Google them, I'm not saying I'm not here. <laughs> you know, actually, but this was the first time I'm writing a full length and I had like a pitching New York meeting, like, oh, this is what I'm doing. And he was like, I want like, yeah, like I'm, I'm interested. Let's get this off the ground. And, um, full lengths are hard. Full lengths are very hard. Uh, it's a lot. So I would say that I write more in each scene but then i like to go back and with that like mindful eye from like the meditation and the walking and being present i really i'm not a visual person but i'm very auditory can we see that can we hear them yeah does this sound like x does this sound like y and then i tw i do tweak as i go i i really do go back every day and like no that's less is more i'm uh -huh. big on less is more and i also love a writer that can, yeah, it's one thing to tell a story. That's like level one. Yeah. Okay. We can tell a story. That's good. Telling a story is good. Two, do the characters sound different? Can you close your eyes? Are they two different characters? Okay. That's good. That's good. Now what's step three? Can you make it sound like music? Then we have a beat and a beat and a beat and a beat. That is what I'm personally working on right now because I want an audience member to sit and hear my full length play cancel ride and not only be in the story and not only be like, wow, I wrote a role with dialogue. Great for this character, for this. Cause you also think you're writing for actors and imagine that you're mm -hmm. writing for really good actors because so, I mean, you know, so they're going to take it somewhere, but now to get to that uh, extra <laughs> level, I want to get to, can we, can we keep it catchy? Can each yeah. back and forth sound like music? Yeah. And that's where I'm currently trying to, in my craft, that's what I'm exploring, is um, how do we make these words sound like music? Oh, that's incredible. And it gets me uh, going into a thousand different directions just because it's <laughs> one of my favorite things ever is trying to find that balance between what seems very mechanical, very studious. You have this structure of the, of the thing that you want to say and, and how you want to say it. But at the same time, it's that effortlessness that needs to, to be a part of that world that you're building. But I'm, I'm going to stop you right there. Yeah. It looks effortless. Yes. It looks effortless. Exactly. There is so much effort. And then I always go back to that annoying story of Picasso, like drew that sketch in the yeah, cafe. Yeah. The woman was like, can I buy that sketch? And he's like, that'll be $12 billion or whatever. <laughs> Well, Bronx, I don't know, whatever Picasso was charging. She's like, but it took you two minutes. And he's like, no, it took me a lifetime. Like, actually, right. that's like really true. Like, actually, that's, 
Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and, and like make it look easy. Yes. It should seem effortless, but. And, and if there's a writer listening that can make it, I mean, God bless you. I, I find it to be tremendous effort and tremendous going back like, mm, you know, and I had wonderful mentors and they don't let me get away with any, anything. Uh-huh. Like, yeah. Sometimes I watch stuff on TV and I'm like, I could never get away with that. Like, <laughs> people in my corner, and it's so important to have people in your corner that'll tell you like it is. And I, I have a lot of, the, I have a lot of those people. Um, but it's it's tremendous effort. Mm-hmm. That's like if you looked at a mansion, like wow, that was like so easy to make that house. Like it's yeah, like oh yeah. my god, we had to go buy the land first. Right, like, <laughs> right. And just to be sure, I want I want to make sure that you know I'm a hundred percent with you on this. I think all yeah. of this must be by design, you know. And yeah. and uh, in order to allow the actors to take it to the next level, I I also think that there is a a beautiful thing that happens in playwriting where you um you have to surrender a lot of that um how has that ever been a difficulty with you um or is that part of the 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 beauty of the collaboration that you get to have with actors i have to say i'm very hands off at this point i would say 27 on i'm 32 yeah because i don't i'm actually extremely hands off i don't at this point and again it's where you are and what other obligations you have I go to ta- I go to the table read, I go to tech and that's and I see a couple of the shows and I make sure the directors that I'm hiring and working for know this because some people want and I've worked with directors that want more input and I'm like, I got something else to do or <laughs> typically at this point in my business, I'm going from one thing to the next and I'm trying to finish a full like, I don't have I, I hate this word, but it's it's a word the bandwidth. Yeah. Also, yeah. I don't have the insight <laughs> or desire. Like, I am not a director. I sure am still not an actor. I don't, I also, I don't really care, which is a terrible thing I should not be saying on a podcast. No, but, but like, it's, it's perfect. It's I perfect. I would rather go write something else. I yes. don't really, I don't see things like, well, I, I get this a lot and I'm always trying to come up with different ways to say, but like, is this how you envisioned your show at Playwrights Horizon, Sarah? Like that could be a question for my 10 minute play overdose. I don't envision it. I hear it. That that sounded cool. And then I give it to the director and then she does her job and makes magic and the actors do magic and the lighting and the sound people do magic. And I, I don't, I'm so detached at that point because I'm working on something else. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's just different kinds of writers. There's a lot of playwrights I know that also direct their work. And um, I just have had so many calls with like beloved directors that I work with where they're like, oh, I think we should film it or I think we should get it and we should do that. And I'm like, really? That sounds like a lot of what you really <laughs> want to put that much time and energy. Like I remember my dear friend who w- is interested in producing my full length, um, he was like, oh, well, you know, I showed this to some filmmaker and we really should. And I was like, no, we're going to rewrite the show for Zoom. And like, that's like, I just <laughs> that's, rewrite it that's so the best later. you can do. <laughs> I, like, I don't, I don't have, I don't want to put money in it. I don't want to like, and then I have other friends who are like, well, you can always self-produce if your play doesn't get. And I'm like, no, then I'll go write something that wins something like, or mm. like I'll just apply to something else. Like I don't, um, I don't have patience. I'm not mm-hmm. a patient person. Mm-hmm. Blame the Aries moon. I don't know. I'm not really a, um, I'm not someone who is like, this is it. Like usually mm-hmm. whatever I'm writing, I'm like, no, this one's it. Like uh-huh. this is it. And then I finish writing it. I seep into a small depression and then I go find something <laughs> else to write. Um, but I just, um, I don't, I don't have anything that's like my baby because I don't, I don't have patience mm. really. Right. So it's, I think it's uh, what you're talking about to, to not be precious about what you're, what it is that you're doing, but you're, you're more obsessive about output and, and the being in the work rather than this one is going to be my saving grace or this particular piece is going to be the breakthrough thing or, or the big one. Uh, but I also love that your counter offer was let zoom is the best I can do. <laughs> that's that's right that's right cut it off but, we should go raise money and do it it's like no i'm gonna rewrite yeah. the place so it's on zoom so we don't spend any money yeah but like, you know your yeah. limits yeah yeah you you know what your limits are and i think yeah. that this is something that maybe a lot of us maybe me personally i i need to learn which is 
knowing what my boundaries are that keep me away from writing. Like, like yeah. I, I do too much sometimes and I'm like, shouldn't I be writing? No, it's because I got distracted by this other thing and then this other thing. But how does one go about dis- not deciding, but, but sort of parsing through a lot of the noise that we see to determine that clarity that you seem to have found um, quite early on? What can you control? We can't control the reviews. We can't control who's going to pick it up. We can't control what the actor's going to do. What can you actually control? I can write something really good that I'm proud of. And then the rest is up to God. Hmm. So I, I, yeah, I mean, that's uh, something that we all probably need to get stamped on our foreheads or maybe frame on our walls. But if we could talk about comedy for just a moment, though, because that seems to be your, your, main focus right dracula in denver my play that's going to have its fifth production in a year and a half is very serious <laughs> it's about dracula's adventures on hinge so tell me about dracula how does that one begin and, and how do you find the germ for that uh, particular script well i think um i do write i do write comedy just to uh because i i think that life's funny I think my breakthrough class in when I was getting my BFA, I wasn't really writing anything particularly funny or good, uh, in my opinion, till like junior year of my conservatory. And I was kind of like, what am I doing? And then uh, we had this professor who was like, write the most boring scene of your life. And I wrote it about the call center and the admissions office where I work, but I wrote it in like meticulous detail of like, <laughs> down to like what was in the vending machine and like that actually became like who I am as a, so I would say like 20, that, that is, I don't think I've actually veered very far off of it, (laughs) but it's just like the meticulous minutia of like the day. Mm. Um, because it's for me, comedy comes from slowing down and like, wait, that's like really weird. <laughs> like, wow, that's so annoying. And yet we live with this all day. So it's just like, yeah, the, the, the minutia of, you know, Dracula is relocated to Denver for the housing to take advantage of the housing market. <laughs> because like, why couldn't he be that practical? Uh, that's amazing. And so uh, was this uh, something that I mean, you mentioned that you you try to work fairly quickly or you try to get these scripts out as, as soon as you can, right? But what was the process of, of getting this thing ready to go into production? Yeah, Dracula and Denver, I, I usually write things for, if it's 10-minute plays for a contest that I'll see. I saw your, your Worst Nightmare Festival in San Francisco, and I was like, oh, I'm going to write that prompt. And I think writing prompts is a great way if you don't know what you're doing. Like, if you want to write something but you don't know where to start, um, like I have my full length play right now, which is like, is my passion project. And I have things I want to send it to like Jersey city incubator. And now I got uh, a friend, uh, collaborator interested in producing and helping me get a life for it, which I've never had before. Mm. Um, but usually if I, if I, if I'm like, I'm not writing any, what should I write? What's like, what's for sale? Like <laughs> what are people <laughs> listing right now? What apartments are for rent? So I'll just like see what kind of prompts there are are out there um but then there's differences because like overdose was yeah overdose i wrote there was a prompt for uh a waiting room like write a play about a waiting room and so i wrote overdose which is about a date that's going really well but then they walk in on the guy's roommate overdosing on oxycontin Mm -hmm. and they end up in the hospital waiting room and they're waiting and waiting for the doctor to give them something reassuring. And the doctor is so burnt out from the <laughs> pandemic fatigue that she's not at all reassuring. And that's the end of the play. And I want to tell everyone it was rejected for the contest that I applied to. And then it won second place, best short in the Playwrights Horizon Downtown Urban Arts Festival. So that just goes to show you, which if you tell me that's not a comedy, I see <laughs> like the irony of that. Like it lost the community theater Midwest production that I wrote it for, but one, like just to give you a sense of like, what can I control? That's Let's amazing. just examine, let's unpack that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, let's unpack that. Let's also yeah. unpack the fact that talking of control, 
I've written shows about opioid epidemic, um, you know, women in the workplace, minorities in the workplace. And my show that in a year and a half has had going to be six productions is Dracula in Denver. Like, I also want everyone to hear that because I've written issue plays about like things that really matter to me, the, you know, like serious mm -hmm. issues. But my big selling commercial <laughs> mark of Dracula in Denver has, is the most produced play I've mm. ever written. And it's just like, what? Like, but, <laughs> like I know that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So how do we thread the needle? Is that, is that a possibility in this, in this uh, world that, that requires something that's either full of entertainment and, and then there's the issue plays on the other end of the spectrum? Is there a way to marry those two things? Can you have some of these, some of these issues talked about in a comedy in a way that can be illuminating in some way? Or is that something that's not part of your philosophy or, or can those things merge? Well, I think, um, I mean, Overdose was a comedy, but, you know, funny things happen. You can find humor in anything. Um, and issues like the, the key in my mind is don't make it an issue. Just make it life. Like, how is this real? Mm -hmm. How how would this happen? Like, mm -hmm. what about this situation? You, you, you take away the issue and you just make it life and normal. Because mm -hmm. unfortunately, a lot of these terrible things are normal. But yeah, I know uh, Reggie Gaines, who's the festival coordinator in like Tony Work, big deal at Playwrights Horizon downtown Urban, where I was just at. He was telling us opening night ceremonies. The key is to write a hit without writing a hit. <laughs> and I think that's like, you know, he also would say like, well, what, you know, if you're watching comedy, but you can tell that there's like poignant topics in there, he would say, what is the ghost behind the words? Like, what are we really trying to say? And I think, you know, I'm 32, but with Cancel Ride, I am trying to talk about, it covers 2015 to 2022. So we're going to go through the Trump election and we're going to go through the pandemic with this quirky group of people in Washington Heights. And um, as I'm writing it, and it's taking a long time because it's like layering um, a painting. So mm. like you start a painting with a sketch and then you put in color and then, and then, and then you start to be like, Oh, talk about, you know, quote effortless. It's oh so <laughs> much effort. But I think if you layer layer, but know what your end goal is. If your end goal is I want an absurd comedy it's absurd and you're living in that world. I personally being a big, like Will Eno, Fortin Wilder fan, like the disgusting minimal, like real, like <laughs> let's like, really look at this desk and how, you know, like yeah. we are so in the moment. <laughs> it's like, wow, we are so in the moment. Like I like that slice better. Mm -hmm. um, and I think of movies like, moonstruck or like anything will you know where we just we know what we know everything we're so in this world mm. um and by being so in this world in this person's story we're illuminating life but that almost doesn't matter because it's really just so carefully we're carefully in this world oh that's fascinating and uh Pretty incredible to think about things that way. I it, it makes me want to watch Moonstruck, but I'll leave that for another another time. Chairs never look better. Yeah, yeah. So just a couple more questions to be mindful of your time here. This has been phenomenal. Uh, but oh, I I'm curious if uh, if you could share a few things about where you're coming from in terms of of location and place because you're you're very much at the heart of theater, at the heart of performing arts there in in your neck of the woods. Does that make its way into your plays, or is that not a requirement to to have that influence, or is it is it something that's organic and never forced, or how do playwrights in your neck of the woods think of the city as a location for their work? Such a wonderful question. When I'm on the shore, it's like the ocean is itself a character, and I do have to say, writing a coming of age story, I did set it, my cancel ride, I set it in Washington Heights in the Upper West Side because 
when I was those girls' ages, it goes 25 to 32. I lived, you know, in those places except for the pandemic. Mm. And it helps to be able to see, oh, they're on the roof and they're looking at the equinox across the corner where someone saw Amy Schumer. It's like, <laughs> it makes it real because those were, those were things. Um, I want to say that location isn't important, but I also think that, I think what they told um, Louisa May Alcott were write what you know. I'm just going to go to that because I think it's really important to write what you know. And in a lot of my clients, like when I'm coaching, we go through guided imagery. Uh, I know somebody wanted to write about like, for example, like a carnival. And like, so we did a visualization about the carnival. And when you write from where you know, like I wrote about the admissions call center because I I'd spent earlier that morning making, you know, Fifteen dollars an hour, whatever the student <laughs> wage was. To, um, you know, I was there. I knew what was in the vending machine. I knew where the clock was. I knew where the phones were. I knew where the person that chewed really loudly was. <laughs> um, and I think that's such a great jumping off point. Um, but also, like, I don't know what it's like to live in Arizona. Um, I don't know what it's like to be a person living in New York City that is a first generation from another country i know you know and that was actually my biggest success i guess you could say was that nasal spec if you want to use those words mm. but i remember telling my mentor i think it's too easy to write nasal because i kind of look like her and i am a jewish girl <laughs> living on the upper west side like it was a little too easy and he was like that's why you should write it because mm. it is you like it is i remember i had friends when mrs mazel came out we're like oh my god sarah like this <laughs> show is so you like this is your life and i was like well i, I don't have children like and i'm not a stand-up comedian i'm not married I'm in the 50s but yes i guess your point like this is very similar. we happen to look a little bit like yes i get it i get it okay and i do live on our block you know like there's a lot of like all right that's suspiciously familiar yeah yeah but i did write it because I, I i am in that world like <laughs> what's it like to be like you know have a close-knit jewish family and like oh i'm attractive so i can't be funny like i do <laughs> i do understand like you're not what people expect which i i love that about people is she's She's not what you expect when you see her. She's so much more. And aren't we all? And if I can, you know, you show through one character, like, no, I'm not just this. I know I look like this, but I'm really all the colors of the rainbow, all the dimensions. And, and, and that's so I say, yes, write what you know, right from where you come from. I'm not going to try and write a story about being in the potato famine in Ireland. Um, I don't have that experience. I like potatoes, but that doesn't mean I'm qualified to write about the potato famine. Oh, man. <laughs> I was going to say that's an amazing note to end on, but I got one more question for you here. Yeah. If uh, You've given us a lot of fantastic recommendations, uh, but I'm curious if there are some things that you're enjoying right now, whether it's plays or, or media of any kind, you know, like a new show or obviously Maisel, things that, um, that, are setting, that you feel are setting you in the right direction. I do love the reboot of Sex and the City. I know this is not what people think I'm going to say, but I love the reboot <laughs> of Sex and the City because, you know, when I was 16, I would look up to these women to explain things that I didn't understand about sex and dating and the big city and money and fashion. And now I'm 32 and I'm watching these women still stumbling around, trying to figure out. And there's something extremely comforting about that. Mm. Also, it's just like so fun escapism to just be like, oh, let's just look at Carrie's apartment. Good <laughs> God. Let's just look at this for an hour because this is amazing. I'm a huge, I think I've watched every single episode of RuPaul's Drag Race mm. and of America's Next Top Model. I don't know what that says about me, but they're wonderful reality shows. And I just love the passion and the glamour um, of these shows. Uh, love watching i like to watch movies more than television because mm. sometimes tv and i think a lot of tv writers <laughs> it starts to feel like work and you can kind of predict like it's gonna mm. be a break there like oh we got plot line b c d like yeah. so i do really now the only exception to this is going to be any show on hbo because hbo is just like they're killing it 
Always, killing it. always and forever. Yeah. The last of us, I was sobbing. And then someone was like, you know, this is based off a computer game. And I was like, I don't care what it's based off of. I'm worried about him. Um, so, oh my yeah, goodness. I would say I love to watch movies. I also have never written a movie and I probably don't have the patience to write one. So I find it like, wow, I really, this is vacation. <laughs> You know, there's uh, there's so many things that I, I like to ask you now, but I feel like we're just scratching the surface. Could have gotten more screenwriting. Obviously, reality TV needs its own episode. I mean, you, I, th- I think that we could have a long conversation about that. But uh, overall, listen, uh, this has been amazing, Sarah. And I just want to thank you for your time, for the service that you're providing for playwrights and people who want to get started in this field. And for reminding us that comedy is so ever important and always not something to be undermined because it's very necessary. So uh, is there any place where we can find more information about the intuitive writing coach services? Yeah, uh, I'd say the easiest thing to do is just go to my Instagram, which is at Miss M I S S uh, Congress, C O N G R E S S S, or you can just DM me. And also I'm going to post in the chat you which if you're listening you wouldn't know actually we'll look at that but here we'll we make, go. yeah we'll make sure it gets in the episode description there perfect it's perfect add on nycplaywrights.org um for one-on-one coaching um but unfortunately i'm a little bit addicted to instagram so <laughs> best place to find you there <laughs> yeah, definitely. i'll be there watching bethany frankel like eat something on her <laughs> All right, Sarah. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. I wish you all the best in uh, in the writing and coaching world, but thanks so much for your time and I'll be in touch on the internet. Thank you, LinkedIn, for making this possible. We're not sponsored, but thank you for making this possible. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. That's right. Got to change that attitude. Yeah. <laughs> thanks so much, Sarah. Have a great Thank one. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.